And you know what else he's given me the privilege to do? Learn how to forgive and how to move forward, how to live on that higher ground. Because some of you in the room, you go, I'm fine. And the way you handle people that maybe hurt you or, you know, whatever, you would never use the word hurt because then that would make you look weak, you know? And so you go, you know, they, you know, they, they did a little thing to me, but it's no big deal. And so I just cut them off. I just deleted them from my phone. I just unfriended them on, on Facebook. How many of you, listen, I'm not going to ask for a raise of hands, but I know there are many of you in the room that have unfriended people on Facebook. And just so you know, I have too. But sometimes you get that little adrenaline rush when you push that unfriend button. There's this little like, ooh, that felt good. <laughs> they don't even know I unfriended them, but it really felt good. Some of you delete them. You unfriend them. Others of you just avoid them. Maybe you don't unfriend them, but you just avoid them. You just, if they're in one spot in the room, you go to a different spot in the room. If they're at the family gathering, you come late, leave early because you don't want to have a lot of contact uh, with that person. Some of you, it eats you alive when you start thinking about somebody that you need to forgive. It literally eats at you when you think about them. Some of you, it eats at you every day. And it, it literally comes to the point where you get sick to your stomach when you think about how badly they hurt you and everything that took place. Sometimes it's a little comment. Other times it's a, a big comment. Other times it's a conversation. Other times it's actually a pattern of abuse maybe that somebody put on you. But we all have the opportunity to learn how to forgive. But this is hard, y'all. And I talked about how where sometimes some of you, this kind of eats at you. And uh, there's an old saying that I was reminded of as I was prepping this week for this message. The old saying is that, that unforgiveness is like taking poison and waiting for the other person to die. It's like taking poison and waiting for the other person to die. And the question that we want to wrestle with throughout God's word this morning is not, how do I forgive somebody one time? No, the question that Joseph is going to show us and that Jesus is going to teach us from, from the word here in a few minutes is actually, how do I forgive somebody not once? How do I forgive somebody over and over again? How do I do that? Because in our own human nature, we're not built to forgive. We're built to avoid. We're built to cut off. We're built to have unhealthy confrontation. We're built to get angry. We're built in our lives to have unforgiveness issues to the point where it affects our relationships because of our past unforgiveness. We have trouble bonding and trusting people in our future relationships. We're built not to forget. So how do I forgive someone over and over again? Well, Joseph is going to model that for us uh, in God's word this morning. And just so, so to give you a little catch up, maybe if you haven't had a chance to pop in on this Joseph series that we, we have been in, let me just catch you up on his life. Joseph is the younger brother of a long uh, line of, of brothers, and he's also the favorite son, which makes his other brothers jealous and angry. And so at a young age, when he was a teenager, they actually throw him into a pit, they sell him into slavery. He's actually sold to a, a, a owner of a, a property, kind of a wealthy, rich, powerful person, all the way in a foreign land called Egypt. He goes to a place where he doesn't know the language, he doesn't know the customs, he doesn't know the culture, and he is sold into this slavery. He rises in power and influence. Something goes really wrong in that house that he's in, and it actually lands him in jail for 10 years. He arrives, like we talked about last week, at a moment of opportunity to serve the highest person in the entire land of Egypt. His name is Pharaoh. And Pharaoh is not only the, the name of this person, it is actually the title of this person. They are the ruler. They're the king. They're in charge. And he finds himself in a moment where he is serving Pharaoh. And he solves, actually, a world crisis of famine during this time. And then, because of his 
problem solving skills and the supernatural ability that God gave him to interpret some dreams that took place. He actually ends up being second in charge of all of Egypt right under Pharaoh. And when the famine hits the world, these different people, these big groups start coming to Egypt because they had prepared for the famine and they were the ones that had food and could actually solve the world's issues. And on these treks that people are coming to see Joseph and see Egypt, wouldn't you know it, he ends up with his brothers in front of him. His brothers that he had not seen most likely in about 20 years. 20 years ago, they had sold him into slavery. Now they're coming to Egypt. They had no idea they were going to bump into their younger brother who they had sold into slavery. And they're coming because they need food and the family needs food. In Genesis chapter 42, you can we're not going to read it together, but you can read that they actually end up bowing before Joseph. Now, if you remember the story of Joseph, this is a big deal because the entire thing has now come full circle. Do you remember when he was 17 years old and he had the dream as a teenager that one day his brothers would bow before him? This is the moment. It has arrived. Here's the big thing, though. They don't know it's him. He's had a name change. He's not speaking the language. Most likely, he's dressed in garb that, to where they wouldn't even recognize his face. And in Genesis chapter 45, what, it, what happens is, I'm going to call it the big reveal takes place. He recognizes them. He actually uh, puts them in jail for three days. They come out. There's a bunch of trickery that happens. I can't, don't have time to, to dive into uh, this morning. But he overhears them talking one day, and he overhears them talking about, you know what, 20 years ago, we did this thing where we sold our brother, and we actually lied to dad and said that, that our brother had been killed. And they're coming to a moment where they realize we actually need to take accountability for what we did. It's time to do something. And Joseph, they didn't know it was him, but they, he overhears them and does this big reveal. Let's look at the big reveal. Genesis 45, one through three. Then Joseph could no longer control himself before all of his attendants, and he cried out, have everyone leave my presence. Now, I want you to picture this, y'all. Joseph is the guy. Other than Pharaoh, he's the second in charge. And most likely, it's a little bit of a throne room-like setting where he is elevated on a platform of some kind, in a chair of some kind, and he's got all these different servants and people. He's got an interpreter that is translating because he's speaking Egyptian, and this interpreter is actually translating into Hebrew, which his brothers spoke, and Joseph knew it was them. They didn't know it was Joseph, and he, he finally has come to the end of it, and he's tired of the game, and he says, okay, everybody out. I just want to talk to them by myself, which at the time, I'm sure his brothers are like, well, how are you going to do that? You speak Egyptian. We speak Hebrew. Watch what happens. So there was no one with Joseph when he made himself known to his brothers. And he wept so loudly that the Egyptians heard him and Pharaoh's household heard about it. Joseph said to his brothers, now let me say this. He said to his brothers in Hebrew, his original dialect that they didn't know he spoke. He said three words that would change their lives forever. I am Joseph. And there are different versions uh, that, that talk about the different ways that they reacted. Some versions say that they were strangely silent. Other versions say they were terrified. Other versions of the Bible say they were dismayed. I have one word that I think summarizes all of the different versions. Awkward. Here we are. 20 years has passed. We sold him into slavery. Now we are bowing before him. 
and he, we didn't even know it was him. He reveals himself. I am Joseph. I'm the one that you sold into slavery. I'm the younger brother that you lied to and said, I'm the one that you literally changed the trajectory of my life, including 10 years in prison that I had to serve. And they are at this point deathly afraid. Is he going to punish us? He has the power to destroy us. He has the power to kill us. And the verses go on to tell us, I don't have time to read them, but they go on to tell us he forgives them. And then for about 17 years, they live together and they live in this kind of forgiveness state uh, where they're okay. Their family, their family kind of lives in the area and then something goes wrong in Genesis chapter 50. In Genesis chapter 50, dad dies, Jacob dies. And the brothers get scared again. And they go, hey, what if Joseph actually didn't forgive us, but he was just trying to keep the peace for, for the sake of our father, for the sake of dad? And uh, if that happened, then actually now is his time. He's going to get vengeance on us. He, he is going to uh, hurt us. He's going to destroy us. And so they come up with this plan that we read about in our opening passage where they're like, we're going to actually make up this story that dad tell Joseph, please forgive your brothers and don't harm them uh, for what they did to you. Complete lie. These, are, these guys are like professional liars. They're very good at, at lying. Hasn't nothing, not a lot's changed in 20 years. And, uh, and so they make up the story and they tell Joseph, dad told us, and Joseph knew it was a lie. And Genesis chapter 50 verse 18 is his response. His brothers then came and threw themselves down before him. We are your slaves, they said. But Joseph said to them, don't be afraid. Am I in the place of God? I just want to stop right there. This is even in my notes. But I just want to say, when we refuse to forgive people in our lives, we place ourselves as the ultimate judge of them and you are taking a role that only God has. Hello? Joseph made this clear. I'm not God. I'm not going to judge you. And then verse 20 is a perspective, watch this, that Joseph had learned to live on higher ground. He had a higher perspective. Verse 20 is the verse, I think if we can all get in our hearts, we can understand. Verse 20 says, you intended to harm me, but God intended it for good to accomplish what is now being done, the saving of many lives. So then don't be afraid. I will provide for you and your children. And he reassured them and spoke kindly to them. How is Joseph able to do this? They did the unthinkable, y'all. You want to talk about injustice. They threw him in a pit, sold him into slavery. He ended up in prison for 10 years. He did, they changed the trajectory of his entire life. Some would say it like this. They stole his childhood. How in the world is he able to look at these brothers that did this to them, not only forgive them once, but forgive them again over and over and speak kindly to them? Well, verse 20, I think, is the highlight verse because he understood what you intended for harm, God intended for the good. And you notice he didn't even say the good of himself. He said the good to save many people's lives. God used what Joseph went through to help other people. Again, the question we're wrestling with this morning is, how do I forgive someone over and over again. And I want to look at not only Joseph as a model that is able to do this so well, I, I want to look at uh, a passage that Jesus actually talked about when he talked about forgiveness. It's in a book called Matthew. It's in Matthew chapter 18. And uh, in Matthew 18, I'll just set it up for you. It goes through a series of lessons that Jesus is giving. He's teaching on different subjects. And he comes to the subject of conflict and how we should handle conflict in the church. By the way, every way that Jesus tells us on how to handle conflict is the opposite of our human nature. 
And he tells us you're supposed to go to the person. Oh, not gossip about the person, not just leave the church and never tell anybody why. No, you're supposed to go to the person. And then you, if that doesn't work, you take someone else with you. And, and then if that doesn't work, you take it to leadership. And then at that point, uh, that, that you, you know, if that still doesn't work, you, you, you can walk away from the conflict, but you can't walk away from forgiveness. And I just want to say this healthy conflict resolution and forgiveness are one and the same. They go hand in hand. And Peter asked the question. He's always the question guy. He raises his hand because Jesus is talking about conflict. And Peter actually says in Matthew 18, 21, then Peter came up and said to him, Lord, how often will my brother sin against me and I forgive him? As many as seven times, Jesus said to him, I do not say to you seven times, but 77 times. Now, I want to give you some context here. Peter grew up listening to rabbis talk about forgiveness. And rabbis in the Old Testament, if you look into the book of Amos, actually had a number for forgiveness. Their magic number for how many times you forgive people was the number three. So, after three times, somebody offended you and you forgave them. Somebody offended you, you forgave them. Somebody offended you, you forgave them. Three times, forget about it. Fourth time, you're good to go. Peter's trying to be a little more spiritual in front of Jesus and the boys. He's like, hey, Jesus, I'll do better than three. I'll double it plus one. Seven times. He's like, And Peter, I mean, Jesus goes, oh, no, not seven times, but 77 times. Now, I want to help you understand something amazing about this passage. This term, 77 times, is used twice in the Bible. It's used here in Matthew 18, and it's used in Genesis chapter 4, where you can read about a story about a brother that kills another brother. His name is Cain, and he kills his brother Abel. And a guy named Lamech actually says, I'm going to avenge 77 times. Is it coincidence that Jesus actually used the same term where it was used for to avenge and to get revenge in Genesis chapter 4? And Jesus uses the same number in Matthew 18 that says, no, you're not going to avenge the, uh, some, your brother 77 times. You're going to forgive somebody 77 times. We see the contrast here, y'all. Jesus says 77 times times. Then Jesus goes on to tell a story, a parable. It's a made up one, but Jesus has the greatest parables, the greatest stories. Matthew chapter 18, verse 23. He says, therefore, and I just want to stop that one word, therefore, literally means continuous. It means that you're not going to have to forgive them once. You're going to have to forgive them over and over. And then he says, the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who wished to settle accounts with his servants. When he began to settle, one was brought to him who owed him 10,000 talents. And since he could not pay, his master ordered him to be sold with his wife and children and all that he had and payment to be made. So the servant fell on his knees imploring him, have patience with me and I will pay you everything. And out of pity for him, the master of that servant released him and forgave him the debt. I want to give you some insight into this passage. One talent is representative of 16 years of wages. So this talent representative, the, the equality that we're talking about in this passage is that this man, this servant had been released. He had been forgiven of a debt that would be worth 160,000 years of wages. In other words, it's a debt that could never be paid. The guy couldn't pay it back. There's no way it would take 160,000 years for him to make that debt payment. And the king forgives him in one foul swoop. And Jesus understands something, you all. Jesus understands that as he's sitting there talking to this crowd, standing there giving this little story, he understands that he's not just talking about the issue of forgiveness in the story. He's talking about the debt that we owe God, that God forgave us of. Right, right. 
a debt that could never be repaid, a debt of sin and death that we owe God that he literally just wiped clean. That's why in Paul told the church in Colossae, he actually said this. He said, and you who were dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made alive together with him, having forgiven us all our trespasses by canceling the record of debt that stood against us with its legal demands. This he set aside, nailing it to the cross. Jesus is telling the story, saying, this is what I'm doing for you. I'm forgiving this massive debt of sin and death that you owe. And you would think that receiving radical forgiveness should lead to giving radical forgiveness. He who has been forgiven much can surely forgive little. Watch what happens. When that same servant went out, he found one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred denarii. Remember, 160,000 years worth of wages, little tiny debt of a hundred denarii. And seizing him, he began to choke him saying, pay what you owe. So his fellow servant fell down and pleaded with him, have patience with me and I will pay you. He refused and went and put him in prison until he should pay the debt. When his fellow servants saw what had taken place, they were greatly distressed, and they went and reported to their master all that had taken place. Then his master summoned him and said to him, You wicked servant, I forgave you all that debt because you pleaded with me. And should not you have had mercy on your fellow servant just as I had mercy on you? The servant didn't understand that because he had been forgiven and because he had been freed, that he needed to pass that forgiveness on. This is why people that call themselves Jesus followers should have the easiest time forgiving. Because We can't hold grudges because we understand how much we have been forgiven. And when I see somebody that calls themselves a Christian, a believer, a follower of Jesus, who is unwilling to forgive, I understand that they don't understand the forgiveness that they've received. Now here's some truths about forgiveness as we come to a close here quick. Forgiveness is not condoning. It's not saying what you did was okay. Forgiveness is not always even reconciliation. Reconciliation takes two people. Forgiveness is only one. But forgiveness is saying, I no longer hold what happened against you. I'm no longer going to hold this in my heart. I'm no longer going to hold this in my mind. I love at the end of the passage that Joseph, it says that Joseph spoke kindly to them. You can see the forgiveness that happened because he was treating them kindly. I want to give you a secret that summarizes what Jesus taught us in Matthew 18. I'll just start with an old saying. There's an old saying that if you've grown up in church, maybe you've heard before, and it's hurt people, hurt people. I want to add to that. Forgiven people, forgive people. People that understand how much they've been forgiven from Jesus forgive other people. And here's another powerful thing. Freed people free people. Because Jesus set me free. He forgave me of my debt that I owed him. 
and because I am free, I can set other people free that I would want to hold captive in my heart. I can forgive them and I can set them free. I do fly quite often and uh, one of the things that they tell you on, on a flight, that they tell you a few things that if we lose altitude, altitude and the, you know, the mass come down, they, first of all, they say, breathe normal. To which I'm like, there's a hundred percent chance I'm not going to breathe normal if that happens. But then the second thing they tell you, and this has always kind of bothered me, to be honest, is put your mask on first. You have a child, you put your mask on first, and then you can help the child next to you or somebody that's acting like a child next to you. And I always went, that doesn't make sense. It do, that doesn't seem like the Jesus way. We, we help others first before ourselves. But I was thinking about this in relation to forgiveness. And I was thinking about the fact that the reason why you have to put your mask on first is because you need to breathe in oxygen to help others get oxygen. You only can exhale what you have inhaled. And when we as Jesus followers breathe in the forgiveness that he's given us, when we breathe in his grace, his mercy, his forgiveness, his freedom. I didn't deserve this, but I pleaded with you and you died on the cross and you rose from the dead and you did that. You took on my sin and you forgave a debt that I owed. You took that on for yourself. You took on everything that I owed. And God, I breathe that in. I love you. I thank you for your forgiveness, your freedom, your grace, your mercy that you gave to me. The debt that I owed, you gave to me. So God, I inhale that with my life and I will exhale putting that on other people. I exhale forgiveness. I exhale mercy. I exhale grace. I exhale love. I exhale all of that. I give away what I've been given. That's how we forgive over and over again. We understand what he's done for us. So we forgive those who have trespassed. My favorite story is I close. I promise this is the, this, I know it's the second time I said it. This is it. I promise. My favorite story of forgiveness ever is about a lady named Corey Ten Boom. She was in World War II. She was a Jew that was in a concentration camp. Her sister actually died in that concentration camp and she had all kinds of torture and humiliation that happened in her life in that concentration camp that she was in for years. She wrote a book you can read, true story, it's called The Hiding Place. And she shares the story of being in the concentration camp where her sister would die and later having to deal with the trauma of that. And she began to travel to different places and she preached a message of forgiveness. And one day, she tells the story of being 80 years old and speaking at a church. And as she was finished preaching about forgiveness, there was a gentleman that walked forward and he extended his hand to her. She immediately recognized him. He was a guard in the concentration camp that she had been in. He didn't recognize who she was. She knew who he was. She said in her book that all of the images of being tortured, naked, humiliated, ran through her mind. All those things, those horrible things that had been done to her and her sister's death in that concentration camp, all at once when he put out his hand, all those images ran through her mind. He thanked her for her message on forgiveness and then still not knowing that she recognized him, he said to her these words. He said, I did some horrible things as a guard at a concentration camp, 
But since that time, I've become a Christian. And I know that God has forgiven me for the cruel things I did there. But I would like to hear it from your lips. Will you forgive me? She writes, I stood there. I whose sins had had, had every day to be forgiven, and I could not. It could not have been many seconds that he stood there, hand held out, but to me it seemed hours as I wrestled with the most difficult thing I ever had to do. For I had to do it. I knew that. The message that God forgives has a prior condition, that we forgive those who have injured us. If you do not forgive men their trespasses, Jesus says, neither will your Father in heaven forgive your trespasses. I knew it not only as a commandment of God, but as a daily experience. You see, since the end of the war, I had a home in Holland for victims of Nazi brutality. Those who were able to forgive their former enemies were able to also return to the outside world and rebuild their lives, no matter what the physical scars. Those who nursed their bitterness remained invalids. It was as simple and as horrible as that. And still I stood there with the coldness clutching my heart. But forgiveness, she says, is not an emotion. I knew, I knew that too. Forgiveness is an act of the will. And the will can function regardless of the temperature of the heart. Jesus, help me, I prayed silently. I can lift my hand. I can do that much. You have to supply the feeling, Jesus. And so woodenly, mechanically, I thrust my hand into the one stretched out to me. And as I did, an incredible thing took place. The current of God started in my shoulders. It raced down my arms. It sprang into our joined hands together. And then this healing warmth seemed to flood my whole being, bringing tears to my eyes. I forgive you, brother, I cried with all of my heart. For a long moment, we grasped each other's hands, the former guard and the former prisoner together. I had never known God's love so intensely as I did in that moment. <laughs> question for you who do you need to forgive maybe it's a parent who was inattentive when you were growing up maybe it's a sibling who abused you a friend who betrayed you a teacher or a coach that made you feel inadequate a spouse who took advantage of you a boss who just used and abused you, moved on from you. The list is long. Those are just a few examples. Today, what I'm going to ask you to do in just a moment is to have a moment with God where I actually want you to say these words, and I would encourage you to say them out loud. Jesus, because you forgave me, I forgive you fill in the name then I want you to do something else I want you to pray for that person or that group I want you to pray that God blesses them I want you to pray that God has good things for them then maybe some of you after you're done praying here in service need to go home and send a text. Make that call. Get in contact with that person. Friend them on social media again. It's time to forgive. Because you've been forgiven. The only thing I would say when it comes to forgiving other people, a word of wisdom and caution is... Don't go to somebody and say, I forgive you, and then go through the long list of ways that they hurt you. I've had people do that. I've been holding this in my heart for 10 years, and I forgive you for, and then, you know, an hour later, they wrap up. Just say, you know what? Just want you to know I'm thinking about you, praying for you, prayed for you today. I hope you're doing well. And maybe, just maybe, if they reach out, you could say, I, I just want you to know 
I forgive you. Let's move on. Because I've been forgiven. I don't know who it is for you, but I know this is a subject that every single one of us in this room has to wrestle with. 